have David Roller uh, speaking yes. on databases. Yeah. So please enjoy. Thanks a lot, Scott. And uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. It's uh, I'm pretty excited. This is I, I gave this talk at PyCon last year, so you will have to excuse me. There's a couple PyCon specific examples, but hopefully you'll be able to figure them out. Um, so just a little bit about me before we get too far into this. Uh, my name is David Wolliver. I tweet a bunch at, at Wolliver. I'm primarily a Python person. I started PyCon Canada, uh, helped organize PyCon North America, and um, I also started a company a couple years ago called Akindi. And we do, do you know Scantron bubble sheets? Like you're in school, you're filling out the multiple choice tests? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we do those, but less terrible. Yeah, <laughs> setting the bar nice and low. Can I use a number one pencil? You can use any pencil you want, <laughs> pen, except the gel pens, and those don't work so well, but it's actually like honestly one of the biggest questions we get. Um, so the other thing that's kind of relevant to this talk uh, is, is I really, really like SQL. I have probably, you know, if I had a partner, they'd probably be concerned about the level of relationship I have with SQL. So. Today I'm going to be talking about this like, uh, well today I'm going to be talking about count star. Um, count star is the SQL function that, that counts things. So for instance, if we wanted to count uh, the number of attendees we have, we could say select count star from attendees. Um, and that would give us a count of attendees. Uh, now, one day at work, I have this table in my database called messages. Uh, it's, it's a really big table, but I wanted to find out about how many messages I had, so I ran select count star for messages, and I waited, and I waited, and dang, like that, it took, it took almost four, well, three and a half seconds to count the, the 35 million messages I had there. And, and that made me really curious. What the heck is going on? Why, why does it take so long to do that relatively simple, normal operation. So before I get too much further in, I'm just going to take, uh, take a second and step back um, and talk a little bit about SQL and what exactly is a count star. So SQL, SQL is an initialism, stands for Structured Query Language. Um, and it's a declarative language for querying data. So uh, for example, if I wanted to find, look at the list of all the PyCons, I could use a query like select star from PyCons and I would get the whole list of them. And then if I wanted to see only the PyCons in Montreal, I could, I could say select star from PyCons where city equals Montreal and kind of does what you'd expect. Um, of course, there's a whole lot more to SQL than that. It can also do things like aggregate ca calculations. So if I wanted to, for example, count the number of PyCons in Montreal, I could ask for a count of uh, PyCons where the city is Montreal. There we go, we ask them for the count, and we get that number back. Now, uh, just a quick thing, if you're curious about that star, what that's actually saying is count all the PyCons uh, where some value is not null. Uh, the specifics of that, if you know SQL, are interesting, but out of scope of this talk. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Uh, it will only come back to bite you at least once when you're writing SQL. So uh, that covers uh, that covers the querying part of SQL. But the other the other portion of the definition is that declarative part. So before we go any further, as there's going to be some generalizations ahead, these are not going to be 100% true but they are good enough lies for the moment. So a declarative language, like in a declarative language like SQL, what you're doing is you're describing what you want to get back. Contrast that with an imperative language, like say Python or Bash, where you're describing a series of steps and you like, they might give you what you want, they might not. So for example, um, if you were hungry in a declarative language, you would say, you know, I want a lettuce and tomato sandwich. In contrast, with an imperative language, where you're describing that series of steps, you'd have to say, okay, go to the fridge, get me a tomato, get a knife, slice the tomato, and so on. Or possibly for a more concrete example, 
if you remember that query we had earlier to list all the PyCons, if we were going to write that in Python, which is an imperative language, we would have to describe the steps of, say, opening a file, iterating over each line in that file, splitting out the country, city, and year, checking to see if the city's Montreal, and only then printing that row. And again, contrast that with SQL, where we describe what we want. We want all of the data. We want all of the data, all the columns, from PyCons, where the city is Montreal. And we leave it up to the database engine to figure out exactly like what files need to be opened or what caches to check and whatnot. So a really big advantage of declarative languages is that they can be really, really powerful. So for instance, uh, you can see in this like one effect, I mean I've split it into two, but effectively one line of code that replaces the five or six lines of code that we had to use in an imperative language. Now, of course, you could condense that a little bit, but you kind of get the idea. In contrast, one of the problems with declar declarative languages is when they don't do what you expect, it can be monstrously difficult to figure out what's going on under the hood. Um, in contrast with, uh, sorry, in contrast, imperative languages, of course, you're seeing each step spelled out. So like on average, you can kind of make some guesses as to what's, what it's doing. And you have a really good concrete starting point to debug. If something is going weird, something's too slow, something's giving you the wrong answer. So now getting back to that original question of what's going on with that select count star and why, why is it so slow? So obviously the, the first thing we need to do in debugging this and figuring out why it's slow is looking at what's going on under the hood. So in concrete terms, when we're, when we're running this query, what are the actual steps that Postgres is taking to give us that answer? Fortunately, Postgres and every other SQL database has a helpful, a helpful command called explain. What explain is going to do, kind of you know, like the name suggests, is explain what Postgres does to get you the result. So before we look at the count star example, we're going to do a simpler example. We just want to get one message. Message with ID 1234. And here's what that explain looks like. Stepping through for a second. Uh, we, uh, sorry, coming through, we have the query plan. So this is like the plan that Postgres is going to be executing to get us the results. And within that, there's a couple important things to notice. Now, reading query plans is a dark art all in and of itself. So even I've been doing this for years and I'm still just making educated guesses right, left, and center. So don't worry if it doesn't make sense. Uh, give it your best guess and you're like just about as likely to be right as anyone else. So. The first thing to notice here is that index scan. What that's saying is, uh, is that Postgres is going to use its index under the hood to search through the messages and find the one particular message uh, with the ID 1234. Going into the details of how indexing works is like, oh my god, we could do that for hours and that would be fantastic, but that's a little bit out of the, out of the scope of this talk. Um, I would really encourage you to go check out use the index loop.com. Um, I guarantee you, unless you are a full-time database administrator, you're going to learn new stuff from this site, even if you've done, done SQL for years. Uh, I, honestly, I learn something new each time I go through and dig in deeper and deeper into it. So anyway, um, the important thing to know is an ind the index is the tool, one of the tools that the database uses to look up information really quickly and efficiently. Uh, and what that index scan is telling us is when we're going to fetch that one particular message, Postgres can take advantage of the index and give it to us really quickly. Uh, the second just neat little thing here that if you ever look at these, you're going to be curious about, uh, is this cost, is the cost section. Uh, what the cost is saying, it's got two numbers here. The first one is the setup cost. So that is how much time does Postgres have to spend before it can, before it can execute this step in the plan. Uh, the second number there is the total cost of that step. So uh, the numbers, the units are magical and arbitrary, and they only mean things in comparison to others. But I know that on my machine, uh, a cost of eight means instant. There's effectively zero time. The other really cool thing that I want to point out, and this is a thing that uh, most people don't know about SQL databases and specifically Postgres, is 
it keeps a whole lot of really fascinating statistics under the hood of the distribution of data in tables. So when you're running a query, it's actually looking at the values that you're querying on and making educated guesses about approximately how many rows are going to be returned by that query. So in this case, for the pedants, because I don't have a unique index on the ID column, it's guessing that approximately 13 rows are going to be returned. Now in this case, obviously, that is pretty irrelevant because you know, that's the only thing that I want. But that row estimation becomes really important if you have larger joins that are pulling in from a bunch of different tables. And that's how Postgres, one of the tools that Postgres uses when it's deciding what order to execute joins in. Uh, the, other, the other part, the width, is approximately how many bytes there are going to be in that row. So obviously, smaller, better, faster. Um, oh yeah, and, and the last bit is this index condition, which is saying on the index scan, it's going to be looking for ID 1, 2, 3, 4. Anyway, uh, if you use SQL on any sort of regular basis, it's really fascinating to go and look at the, the output of explain on queries that you're running often, even, even if only to see and understand what's happening under the hood there. So, back to our initial question of why count star is so slow. We're going to run explain and get that query plan. Here's what it looks like, and oh my goodness, that's, that's bigger than eight. Um, the important, and the important thing to look at here is actually the second line, the sequence scan. What the sequence scan tells us is that under the hood, Postgres is actually going and looking at every single row in that database. It, it has to go through each one of the 35 million messages. Um, sequence scan, uh, so sequence scan is what Postgres calls a table scan. I, I think, there may, is there a difference? Sorry, folks, please raise your hands if you have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, you're saying? Yeah, um, sorry. And did you have something to say? Yeah, and actually that's probably a good point. I suspect the reason it says sequence scan as opposed to table scan is it could be scanning, like, uh, it could be scanning a view, it could be scanning um, a common table expression. There are many different things it could be scanning, and a table is only one of them. But yeah, when you hear about table scans, uh, same thing. Yeah, so there is like the, the ID column is a sequence, but those two things have the same name but are completely different. Sure? Okay, cool. Um, one of the cool things though, you'll notice, is that Postgres actually has a pretty good idea of how many rows are going to be returned. We get that 35 million there. And as I, I think I say this later, but I'm going to say it now because I usually forget. Uh, if this is an actual problem you have of trying to find out how many rows are in a really big table, you can use Postgres's uh, statistics. You, yeah, you can use Postgres statistics to get that estimate for you. So if you need, only need to know that there's about 35 million, that'll be great. It obviously won't give you an exact, like, precise count. But in many cases, if you're paginating or doing something like that, or you know, like your boss just wants to know how many users you have on the system. That's a great way to get a good estimate. Anyway, we can see now, it doesn't explain why it's slow, but at least we know, it doesn't explain why it has to visit every row, but at least we know why it's slow, because we have to read 35 million of these messages before we can get that count. And like, honestly, that's pretty weird. I mean, Counting things is a pretty common operation, and uh, the database is supposed to do that for me. So why shouldn't it be fast? And like, spoiler, it's not because the Postgres people are dumb. Oh, got to go forward. So obviously, we're good developers. The first thing we do, we hit up Google. The first hit uh, is going to be the Postgres Wiki's slow counting page, and we get this fantastically useful descript uh, explanation. You see. The reason why this is slow is related to the MVCC implementation in Postgres SQL. The fact that multiple transactions can see different states of the data mean that there can be no straightforward way for count star to summarize data across a whole table. Postgres must walk through all the rows in some sense. Yeah, but that is not especially helpful. <laughs> so 
the next thing to, to dig deeper and to understand what's going on, uh, we need to know about MVCC. MVCC is another initialism that stands for multi-version concurrency control. Uh, and what that does is it's the mechanism in Postgres that lets us have multiple different connections reading and writing from the same database at the same time without everything breaking all the time. Which, out of curiosity, have you any of you worked with databases that maybe don't have as much of this in databases like, for instance, the file system, where it works beautifully when you're testing and then as soon as two people start using the system at once, all of a sudden you have data corruption and incorrect values and it's, it's awful. So, I'm going to use the absolute most cliche example uh, of MVCC, which is transferring funds between bank accounts. Yeah, I see some nods. You've, you've seen this before. Um, if we were to write this transfer balance function in Python, say, here's what it might look like. We're going we're gonna, to uh, deduct some amount from the source account. We're going to add that to the destination account. And we're going to save both of those and put those back onto the data store somehow. But, but the astute amongst you uh, will notice that there are actually a lot of problems with this. Uh, one, one of them, though, that I'm going to highlight is this issue here. So let's say your code is executing. That first, that source account is saved. So now that account has 100 fewer dollars in it. But before we get around to saving that second account, maybe because the program crashes or maybe because you're... Uh, your time, your time sharing system is not doing a very good job. Somebody else in the system wants to go and just check the balance of all the accounts. And they're going to find out that there's $100 that has just vanished. It's been taken out of the source account, but it hasn't been put anywhere yet. We have this nice inconsistency. Well, oh, not a nice one. We have a bad inconsistency. And so this is exactly, or, or at least one of, the problems that's addressed by the multi-version concurrency control in Postgres. Ooh, no, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and specifically, the, the tool that one of the tools that Postgres uses to manage this kind of con concurrency is called transactions. So transactions are tools that databases, and I'm going to use specifically SQL databases in this context because I don't know much about transactions in other databases. Um, transactions are a tool that the database uses to let the programmer say that a series of commands either need to execute all at once or not at all. Um, so the best way for me to show you how that works, because you know, you, I'm sure you've all heard that before, uh, is to do every speaker's favorite thing, a nice live demo. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to put some, we got some Postgres connections up here. Is that all big enough? Should I make that a bit large? Um, so we're going to start with some bank accounts. We have Alex and Chris, and they both have five hundred dollars or five hundred bitcoins or five hundred somethings. And uh, we're going to start a transfer. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start a transaction. Begin is the keyword for starting a transaction. We begin. And over on this side here, just to prove that it all works, we can see from the second connection that the balances are both 500, obviously. Now, I'm going to de deduct $100 from Alex's account. And if we we can see that, in fact, Alex has had $100 deducted. But what's really nifty is over here, in the other window, we see this nice consistent state. Both accounts still have $500 in them. Now if we go back, oh my goodness, where's my mouse? There we go. Accounts uh, balance equals balance plus 100 where name equals Chris. And we'll give Chris her $100. You can see that everything lines up nicely. While over in the other, in the other connection, that change hasn't been committed yet until we say commit. And only then 
does every other connection get to see uh, get to see that we made that change? But you'll notice critically that at no point while we were in the middle of making that change could anyone else see it. it the system maintained nice and consistent at all at yeah the system maintained this nice consistency the whole time. And also, of course, like if it was if something was to crash, if the computer was to die, uh, we wouldn't have any issues there either. So back here. Now, I, like, I don't know about you guys, but holy crap, I find this so cool. Um, but, but you're probably wondering, what on earth does that have to do with counting? So, to understand to understand why transactions and, and these atomic updates uh, have anything to do with counting, we actually need to still go one level deeper and understand how those transactions are implemented under the hood. So that's actually like at the level of writing bits to the disk, what's happening there? Or in other words, answer that question of how is it possible that Postgres can have one transaction with one view of the world and a separate transaction with a separate view of the world and because this is Postgres we're talking about, do that in a way where you can have an effectively infinite number of transactions each with their effectively infinite number of views onto the world. Um, so the first thing the first thing that you need to understand to know and to, to kind of, yeah, the first thing to know before you, yeah, let me try this all over again. I'm, I flew in, I had to wake up at five in the morning for a flight today, so I'm pretty proud of myself regardless. <laughs> anyway, the first thing to understand uh, is that rows in Postgres are immutable. So once a row has been written to disk, that, that data on disk is never ever changed. And when there's an update, like that update to the balances, that would kind of logically change a row, instead, a whole new row is written to the end of the table. So uh, to give you a concrete example, let's take a look at what happened when I did those updates. So first thing, I update uh, Alex's balance. I deduct $100 from their account. And that writes a whole new row, Alex with 400 Next, when I update Chris's account, I uh, give her the extra $100. A new row is written for her with a with a balance of six hundred. But now you're probably noticing this table has four rows when really logically we should only be seeing two of them at any time. What's going on? Now this is the final piece of the puzzle here. This value Postgres calls the XID or the transaction ID. The transaction ID is a unique sequential integer that's assigned to each transaction. So each time you start a transaction, you get a new XID. And if you're curious, you can call the XID under current function that gives you your current transaction ID. So in this case, where I'm going to begin a transaction, I'm going to ask for the transaction ID. I get the same value twice in a row. But if I finish that transaction and ask for another transaction ID, I just get the next number in sequence. And for completeness, uh, if you run that command outside of a transaction, post, uh, sorry, if you run a command outside of a transaction, Postgres actually creates a new transaction for you for the duration of that query. And to go even deeper, it actually only does that sometimes. But that's out of scope. So second part, second piece of this puzzle, uh, the rows that are stored on disk actually have, they have a few more columns, but there are two specific columns that they have called the xmin, which is the ID of the transaction that created the row, and the xmax, which is the transaction that deleted that row. And remember that updates are actually deletes and inserts. So if you update a row, we delete the old one, insert the new one. So to go through that example again, now with the xmin xmax, we'll see when we, um, when we update the accounts and add the new row for Alex's new balance, that row's xmin is, the, is 110, the transaction ID of the current transaction. And we update the old row to set the xmax, so the transaction that deleted that row or superseded that row, to 110 as well. Same thing happens uh, for Chris. Now, if you've really been thinking and really paying attention, you've probably been able to figure out what happens next. When Postgres goes to query a table, it actually reads all those rows. It reads the deleted rows in addition to the active rows. 
And it runs a little function that looks something like this to figure out if that row is visible to that transaction. So obviously, if the row's x min, so that is the transaction ID that created the row, is in the future, we can't see it, it's invisible. Or if it's x max, the transaction that deleted the row is, is our transaction or in the past, it's deleted, so we can't see it. And otherwise, we can. Now, if you guys are database geeks, you're probably some of you is going to say, oh, but what about transactions that are aborted? Well, this is a little bit closer to the truth, is that in addition to checking the x min, it also checks to see if that transaction was aborted, and same thing for the x max. And that's actually not true either, because we have to check to see if, um, if, if the transactions were, uh, it's, anyway, they, we can, if you're really curious, you can dig into this later and see the specifics of how it works. But the intuition is good enough for now. And that gives us all the pieces of the puzzle that we need to answer the question of why count star is so slow. Well, because you can see that there actually isn't one correct count. The, the count of the rows in a table is completely dependent on the transaction that you're in and that transaction's particular individual view onto that table. So there's no way that Postgres could reasonably cache that value because it would have to have a new cache for every table for every active transaction. Um, oh, here we go. Oh man, I have that all written down. Um, and how are we doing for time? We, we got, sorry? Plenty. Oh, excellent. So, so um, since we do, excellent. Uh, there are a couple obvious questions that I do want to touch on. The first and probably most obvious is if if updates are just deletes, like if updates are just inserts, doesn't that mean your database will literally grow unboundedly? And, and actually, the answer is yes. If you have um, if you have Postgres with that is incorrectly configured, and you have one table with one row that is just constantly updated, you'll notice that the, the database file on disk will just grow forever. And one of the fun things about Postgres is uh, there's act, sorry. One of the fun things about Postgres is there's actually no way to give that space back to the operating system. If you have a table that has grown unboundedly and it's now 100 gigabytes, even though it has one row in it, the only way to take that 100 gigabytes and release it back to the operating system is to literally copy the whole table into a new place, delete the entire old table, and start using the new table. Now, because Postgres is nifty, you can actually do that online and it kind of works. It's just absurdly slow. Um, but in practice, Postgres has this tool called Vacuum. What Vacuum does is a whole bunch of, a, a bunch of different bits of bookkeeping. One of the bits of bookkeeping that it does is it will go through, it will walk through each table, and it will identify rows that are just not visible to anybody. So, for instance, if the row is x max, that is uh, the transaction that deleted it, is smaller than every active transaction, there's no possible transaction that could see that row, so that row finally gets removed from disk, and that space is freed up to let another row be put in its place. Um, the next thing you may have been thinking is, I did say that transaction IDs are sequential integers. Uh, and you, there's a thing about sequential integers, which is that they overflow. And that one is a little bit more dicey. Uh, another thing that Vacuum will do is it's going to be keeping track of the minimum and maximum valid transaction IDs. So that is, all the transaction IDs below the minimum are irrelevant because they're all completed, and all the transaction IDs above the maximum haven't happened yet, so they're fine. And the transaction IDs add a slight lie in the sense that they are actually circular. So uh, they, they roll around, and the, it's not a strict integer comparison, it's a circular comparison, and I'm sure you can figure out the details. Uh, but the other thing that vacuuming will do is it keeps track of those minimaxes so that they don't get too far apart, and you don't get a message that looks like this. This message says Postgres only has, uh, what is this, two billion, two billion transactions left? How many zeros are we? Three. 177 million. Yeah, 200 million. 200 million is the magic number. After 200 million transactions, it will start issuing this warning. Oh, sorry, uh, that is, once there's 200 million remaining transactions before you get an overflow, it will start giving you this warning. Uh, and then uh, if, if you're having a really good Friday night, you're going to get this warning when it hits 100 million, which 
it just stops and it will it refuses to accept any new any new write uh, sorry it refuses to accept any new transactions that are writing to the database. Um, and if you're curious what happens then. Our buddies at Century were down for about two days because of exactly this problem. And they got a really good write-up on what goes into to fixing and, and dealing with that. Final question you might have, I mean you probably have a whole lot of questions, but uh, the last one that I'm going to answer right now is you notice that each row only has one X max. So a logical question is, what happens if two different transactions try to modify the same row at the same time? And this is one of the things, I love Postgres, don't get me wrong, it's near and dear to my heart, but this really bugs me, is that the only thing that, the, the only thing that will happen is the second transaction will block. So if first transaction tries to update a row, second transaction tries to update the same row, the second transaction, that, that update is just going to do nothing, it's just going to block and wait for the first transaction to complete. Uh, and it's really frustrating because in all the hours and hours I've spent trying to dig into this, there is nothing you can do to avoid that behavior. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah. That yeah, please. Oracle and DB2 have the same problem. Yeah, it's. So this is just a common data problem. It's, it's a thing now. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I don't have in my slides that I will mention because it's really cool. So um, if, you, if you remember with the transactions, when I was showing how uh, we can have two transactions that are active, and while one is making updates, the other still sees that nice, consistent view of the world. Well, uh, there's actually, uh, within a transaction, different things called isolation levels. And that, uh, that controls what data the transaction can see. So by default, uh, in Postgres, I'm almost positive there's like seven of these things, so I can't repeat them all verbatim right now. But it's read committed, so you only see data uh, that, that have been committed by another transaction. I think in MySQL, it's read uncommitted, so you see the uncommitted data. I'm not sure. Uh, but the one I really want to point out with Postgres is this is, is the transaction level called serializable. And what serializable guarantees is that the data that you actually sorry to back up, the problem that serializable solves is let's say I have one transaction going, I query, I read a value like an account balance, and while while that transaction is running, some other transaction updates that value and commits. So that's totally fine because I can read a value, you can update that value and commit the value, but if in my application logic, for instance, I'm using that value and doing something with it, all of a sudden we've got an inconsistent state of the world. So serializable, this just fucking blows my mind, it's so cool. What it does is it actually keeps track of all of the data that a transaction even looks at, so that if when you go to commit that transaction, any of those data have changed, it's gonna, it's gonna throw an error that lets you know that you need to go back and retry. So in that example, I begin a serializable transaction. I read an account balance. You go and update that balance. When I go to commit that transaction, Postgres is going to throw an error saying, hey, some of the data that you relied on have been changed. You need to go back and try that again. I have no idea how that's implemented or what the performance implications are, but. Kevin Gritter is the best. <laughs> uh, he's at Wisconsin courts. <laughs> it is mind, mind bending difficult to understand. Right? Like, I, the only thing I can think is it keeps a cache of all the queries that you've issued, so when new rows come in, it like execute, like it, it checks those rows against the queries. I have no idea. Predicate, there's a predicate logic thing. I've yeah. heard it explained, and, it, and it, it's, hard to, <laughs> it's hard to remember what was explained. <laughs> yes. Well, good. I feel better about not understanding the pages and pages I read about it. So, cool. Um, Anyway, so that's, so that's my talk. I, I also just want to give a quick pitch. Uh, if, if this kind of stuff is cool and, and you think maybe working with, with me might be interesting, uh, I'm, I'm hiring developers right now for, to come work on a Kindy and to make teachers' lives just a little bit less terrible. Uh, so if you do Python stuff, if you do uh, JavaScript, Angular stuff, uh, I'd love to, call, to talk to you. Come say hi afterwards or, or shoot me an email. And yeah, uh, I've also got some references that I will send to Scott and he'll get online. So. Thank you guys so much. Oh, sorry? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is the one I really I should really have up, huh? Um, and any questions? Over here. People with questions, there's a mic over here. Oh yeah, I can also repeat.
Oh, that makes my life easy. Great. Oh yeah, hey. I'll, I'll just repeat the question, it's fine. Okay, um, everything you've been talking about is about Postgres, but of course there's these different varieties that I'm assuming all take a very standard ISO, standard SQL, or whatever. Uh, are there going to be different databases that are optimized for certain kinds of these operations more than others? Yep. And so could you just speak, I know you work with Postgres, but then you must be aware of the relative strengths of some of them compared to the others. Could you just spend a little bit talking about what f yeah. what kind of SQL Postgres is stronger and, 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 and where others might be stronger? I just, I'm not familiar with the field. Yeah, for sure. So I, I actually, and I, the one thing that I know for certain is that uh, Postgres so Postgres is optimized first for correctness, like correctness above all else, and it will sacrifice anything to be correct. Now, obviously, they don't fortunately need to in a lot of ways, uh, but one of the one of the places that they do need to uh, sacrifice efficiency for correctness is that is the fact that they in, is the, sorry is the implementation of immutable rows. So the fact that they add new rows at the end of the table and then have to go later and remove them. Uh, MySQL, for instance, has an optimization where it can detect whether or not there's any transaction that would be able to read a row, and if no other transactions would be able to, it will just update that in place. So um, that means that it can do inserts and, and writes in many, in some cases at least, quite a bit faster, because of course it just it just updates in place and there's, you know, you don't need to go and update your indexes, you don't need to update a bunch of things. Um, the cost of that obviously is the implementation there is a lot more fiddly, and, and I believe and I'm sure somebody who knows better can correct me, that that's one of the reasons that MySQL has historically had data loss issues if you like crash in the wrong place. Um, you sound like you probably know better than I do. Postgres does have something akin to that. There's something called heap-only tuple updates, mm -hmm. oh. where if you are making a change that doesn't affect the indexes, then oh. that in-place change can be Way, oh, neat. you could do that change in place because it's safe. Mm -hmm. But if it's not safe, mm -hmm. then it's not safe, and it must do uh, it must do the invalidation of old tuples and put the tuple in a new place, and so on yeah. and so forth. So it's this is it's not quite a that's a on the one hand maybe it could be faster. Yeah. Sometimes it can be, mm -hmm. and sometimes it can't be. Yeah. Hey, just remind me of the question. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, is, is it a question? Yes. Oh, oh, let me finish. Let me finish answering then. Is uh, in general though, uh, Postgres is is actually really good. Uh, the one I, I can't speak to its comparison with like DB2 and Oracle because I don't I don't know much about those or like SQL Server. I understand SQL Server is like pretty friggin' awesome actually, but <laughs> um, no, no, I'm not. I was have hmm, bad words here. Uh, one one other interesting comparison that I'll make though is to MongoDB. So MongoDB, one of the, well, MongoDB is a document-oriented database, and the idea with it is you take JSON documents, so JSON documents are just like uh, keys and values, so you say like name and the, the value of name can be like a string or another object or a list or a number. Uh, and MongoDB is really cool because you just throw these arbitrary, unstructured JSON documents into it, uh, and it has a fairly good system for developing indices around them. Uh, and querying them so you can say, give me all the documents where the names, like, you know, the third element in this list is some value. Uh, and for a few years in there, it was legitimately one of the best databases if that was your problem. But as of Postgres, like 9.4, 9.5, when they released, when they added uh, JSONB support. So JSONB is a column type in Postgres that lets you have binary, it's a binary storage format for JSON. It's fairly compact, fairly efficient. Um, you know, a whole lot of benchmarks. Storing, storing and querying uh, JSON in Postgres is absurdly fast, like faster than MySQL, uh, faster than um, faster than Mongo. And I actually finished a project, uh, contract project recently, where I used almost exclusively the JSON, uh, sorry, messages stored in JSON in Postgres, and I was it worked astonishingly well. So, I, that, I know that doesn't completely answer your question, but hopefully it helps a little. Hey, yes. Okay, uh, I know Postgres has an auto-vacuuming mm -hmm. uh, option. Yeah. 
So the first question is, do you know how that would work? And secondly, why you would turn it on and off? Uh, so to answer the second question, you, you, you wouldn't turn it off. You, you, auto vacuum is on by default, and it runs at sensible intervals. And for regular workloads, it's just fine. Uh, the, the challenge in when, when auto vacuuming starts to fall down, and the place that I don't know great answers, because this isn't a problem that I've had to deal with intimately, is situations like centuries where you have a, uh, a high write load and very few windows where you can uh, you have no writer, no transactions open for writing in the database at a time. Uh, because for reasons that I'm not going to get into because they're not immediately coming to the top of my head, you have to wait until there are no writers, no active write transactions to a database before you can start a vacuum. Um, you can start write transactions after the vacuum has started, I think, but is that, is that right? No, you're giving me a look there. No. No, no, it's just a, no we, have, we have stuff that work that heavily, heavily, heavily vacuum okay. all the time. It's, it tends to be very useful to vacuum all the time. Yeah. But it's certainly at choose I.O. Yeah. It choose I.O. And if, you're, if, you're IO, if your system's I.O. bound, you will be very tempted to say, I'm I.O. bound. Mm -hmm. Let me stop everything that's, that doesn't appear immediately necessary that's doing <laughs> I.O. And that might be a mistake. So does that, so does that mean though that I'm that I'm misremembering that you can start when you have right, open rights? That, that would be seven. Okay, seven so this is one. Okay. Oh. In seven one, all vacuums were vacuum full. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, after as of seven two, vacuum became um, regular vacuum was able to be done concurrently. Okay, and it's it's gotten more concurrent over time. Okay, so I, uh, my information must be old there. But it's, the tendency, the temptation is always, my system's pegged because of I/O. Yeah. Let me stop everything that looks like it's unnecessary I/O, yeah. and well, perhaps it, it might it, not vacuuming that table looks tempting, but it might be a mistake. And and to elaborate specifically, why vacuuming takes so much I/O is it literally has to walk through every row that has ever existed in, in the database to check them. There's no kind of shortcut. So if you have massive tables, is that not about quite true? Version 9, it's uh, the... Oh, uh, man. About version 9, that, that, that changed. Oh, so what does that do? Uh, the, uh, the... Oh, what was this? Uh, there's, there's dead pages. It's able to know which, tape, uh, which pages have dead tuples. There's a dead oh, tuple neat. detector. So, uh, so as of uh, to repeat into the microphone, as of version nine, which was like fairly old, Somewhere. fairly nine, 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 nine. Um, I, the Postgres introduced a dead tuple detector in Pages. So, uh, tuples is the fancy Postgres term for rows. I don't actually know exactly why. That's I guess from database, like from the, the old relational algebra days when you started. Yeah, that's anyway. The details are unimportant. Yeah, yeah, the relational algebra stuff. So actually, I do know exactly why. Um, uh, under the hood, Postgres stores each tuple in pages. Pages have um, their fixed size that I don't remember well, con configurable size. Okay, yeah, uh, and in the same way that file systems have pages, it stores the rows in the pages. Uh, and generally, operations perform at the page level. So if you have, uh, I, I lied earlier when I said when vacuum cleans up rows, it actually cleans up entire pages. So if you have a page with one active row in it, that whole page will stay. But as soon as that row is removed, that page is released back for another, you know, for the uh, for the Postgres to start putting new rows in it, into a page. And sorry, you had a comment? Question? Just about oh yeah, please. No, no, he was answering. Oh, that. excellent. Cool. Cool. Thank you all again.